Firstly, a very special thanks to Endless N for gifting me this game on Steam. That was very nice of you, good sir, and I'm deeply obliged. Freedom Planet, Freedom Planet. Why did this name ring a bell? I hazily remembered it being a Kickstarter project. Maybe I saw a trailer of it somewhere. I think I had too much of Shovel Knight, Shantae, Half Genie Hero, and Mighty Number no. 9 on the mind to give it a second thought. I know one thing for certain, during that indie showcase I did last year, there were a lot of you wanting my impressions on it while it was still in development. Um, alright. A second indie showcase was on the cards for next year, around the beginning of spring, but since that generous donor went and bought the game for me, let's just give this game a look-see now. Freedom Planet. Alright, let me just choose, uh, this one. It's pretty nice looking so far, solid detail, 60 frames per second. Oh. 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 That's right, Freedom Planet, an indie studio's variation of a Sonic game, right. I remember now. I, you know what, I wouldn't be surprised if the title of the game was inspired by the name of the main setting in the Sonic the Hedgehog OVA, Planet Freedom. With this game under my belt, just calling it another studio Sonic game is sort of misrepresentative. It was unquestionably inspired by it, and when the development team began working on it, it was initially a Sonic fan game that soon changed into something more original when they wanted to have its own identity. Freedom Planet is a living, breathing throwback to the high-octane platformers of the 90s. Sonic, Mario, Mega Man X, Rocket Knight Adventures got a lot of Gunstar Heroes vibes from it as well. I don't know if you guys ever heard of this little gem. It was made for the Sega Genesis in 1993 and was developed by Treasure, a company that specialized in making vastly stylized action-packed video games. If you thought Contra was explosive, you haven't played this. It's a great time, but get a buddy on your side for maximum enjoyment. Freedom Planet from the very moment you begin a new adventure never stops with the in-your-face setup until everything comes to a climactic end about 5 hours later, but it's also rocking the story to boot, and I think it's the weakest part of the game. It's nothing awful, and you know, it could also be a throwback to how inconsequential video game plots and platformers were back in the days, but it still has a longer than normal runtime, so you can sort of tell they wanted you to pay attention to it in some regard. In all fairness, when you begin the game, you can choose between adventure and classic mode, so if you don't give a shit about stories and this sort of thing, you choose classic, so you can just go from one stage to the next until you reach the final boss with no added fluff. It wouldn't be a full review if I didn't look at that story though, so let's choose adventure mode to see how the story of Freedom Planet unfolds. In this world, known as Avalis, there exists the Kingdom Stone, a relic that possesses an enormous amount of energy that brings peace, prosperity, and all that other stuff. An intergalactic warlord called Lord Brevin invades the planet in hopes of taking the Kingdom Stone for his own benefit, causing unease between the three kingdoms of the world, Shui Gong, Shang Mu, and Shang Tu, by killing the king of one kingdom and manipulating the prince and his army to cause total conflict between the three major powers. An alien named Torque is all too aware of what Lord Brevin is trying to accomplish and heads to Avalis to try to stop him. He sort of sucks at his job though, getting shot out of the sky just moments after entering the planet. Not to worry, he soon gets help via Sash, Lilac, and Carol T, two friends that get caught up in the mess because they just happen to be in the area at the time and they initially don't believe that the Kingdom Stone is in danger until they see the thing get stolen right before their very eyes. Lilac and eventually Carol agree to help Torque retrieve the Kingdom Stone from the clutches of Lord Brevin and save the world, all while dealing with the restlessness between the three kingdoms, Lilac and Carol's past lives, and whatever other hijinks they encounter. The story is pretty commonplace, but Freedom Planet seems to have the hardest time trying to properly pace things. You got the standard intros, nothing wrong there, and you go through two stages without much story going on, and then you're suddenly hit with about 12 minutes of nothing but dialogue, and it happens more than once. Freedom Planet also can't seem to decide on its tone. The story begins with the King of Shui Gong being decapitated by Lord Brevin while the Prince is forced to watch. That's pretty gruesome. It makes you think the whole plot is going to be a dark journey, and it has dark moments in spades. But we also get tons of lighthearted humor that wouldn't be out of place in a kid's TV show. Hey, I like. Hmm? How come Tork doesn't want to hang out with us? He said he had some work to do. Eh, he's probably just scared of getting cooties. Cooties? <laughs> Okay, I think that's enough fun. I really thought the voice acting was going to be nothing but cringeworthy lines and delivery, and you have the intro to thank for that. Sorry, I just wasn't a fan of the King's performance, but everything gets better after that. The good guys try to come off as natural sounding as they can, which is great. No need to be overly giddy about this sort of thing, I'd rather they be down to earth. And the bad guys are all over the top and deliciously entertaining. Mad props to Alexander Boriga. His performance as Lord Brevin was awesome. It's that guttural growl he can reach that gives him domineering qualities. A game like this doesn't need a deep, layered plot to be good, and I can commend them for trying. It really feels like they did, damn it. But at the end of the day, the final result is more of a C plus than a straight up B. Take it from me, Freedom Planet is worth the $15 price tag on the quality gameplay alone. Colorful and shiny graphics alongside an energetic soundtrack that I ended up immediately buying on their official Bandcamp page after finishing the game are components that only help emphasize the solid adventure that is Freedom Planet. 
it was a bit strange for me. It controlled like a Sonic game. It definitely looked like a Sonic game. I was thinking Sonic CD all over my first playthrough, but it wasn't a Sonic game, and I needed to remind myself of that when I started. Familiar gimmicks and conventional platforming challenges are spread throughout. For an indie title, it's relatively safe with its level design, but every zone has something unique about it besides the way it looks to offer you something new to complete. You can protect yourself with power-ups you find, including a variety of shields and invincibility, and shiny trinkets are abundant to help keep your health bar nice and full and increase your totally useless live counter. Even if you get a game over, you restart at the last checkpoint instead of at the beginning of the level. Lives are meaningless here, unless you're going after that no-death achievement. That's probably the only reason why it's here. It's also sort of weird, yet refreshing, that for a 2D game, enemies can't damage you just by colliding with the player. They need to actively attack you to cause damage, so you have time to react appropriately and either counter with your own attack or bypass them to keep the pace up. Sometimes it's not about how one game separates itself from the others, but rather refining or celebrating what already works and making sure the game is, above all else, fun rather than different. Nobody's praising Shovel Knight because of how it changed the industry, they praise it because it's a really fucking fun game. I find Freedom Planet similar in that regard, but as a longtime Sonic fan, I admittedly had some muscle memory issues. I count it like around eight times where I instinctively held down on the D-pad when I was in the middle of a loop or downward slope to roll into a ball, but Lilac ain't no hedgehog. She sort of looks like one, I don't really buy that she's a dragon, but whatever. Carol can do a spinning roll, but it doesn't have quite the same impact or use. She's more of a close-range combatant that can scale walls like in the Mega Man X series, and she has a motorcycle power-up that lets her speed things up and ride alongside walls like in Blaster Master. Lilac is more of the eloquent type. She can double jump, which also counts as an attack, plus she has a number of offensive options she can utilize by pressing the attack button in conjunction with the direction of the D-pad. It's kind of like Smash Bros. thinking about it now. The Dragon Boost is her most distinctive technique though. She revs up and dashes in any given direction that isn't straight up or straight down. I don't know why she can't go directly north or south unless I'm not doing something right here. I suppose northeast and northwest are close enough. Out of the three characters available, I enjoyed using Lilac the most. Having two jumps and a multi-directional Dragon Boost makes her very ideal for shooting through levels with little reason to stop, unless you're exploring for collectibles, and that's where she sort of falls a little flat. Lilac can only Dragon Boost when her special meter is filled, which constantly refills when you're not using it, but on occasion, you can find yourself with a mistimed Dragon Boost or Jump, and you have to wait until the meter recharges, bogging down the pace. It's a very minor thing, but it eventually adds up. I don't have to worry about that sort of limit with Carol because of her wall jumping abilities, and when she gets her bike power up, it's a blast running through enemies and scaling walls swiftly. But without the bike, Carol is not as nimble as Lilac, and she has a slightly harder time with enemy threats when she has to battle in the first place. At the very least, she's not Mila, a third character you can unlock after certain events unfold in the story. I think she's supposed to be the hard mode via limitations. She has an amazing double jump that's like Yoshi's flutter jump in Yoshi's Island, and she has great defensive capabilities with her shield, but her attack options are nearly non-existent. A green block that takes a bit of time to materialize, and a dinky laser that could leave her wide open if she doesn't hit with it. This isn't much of a problem during stages where combat can be mostly avoided, but in boss fights she has to play the waiting game a lot, and that wasn't very fun for me. Now, boss fights with Lilac and Carol, oh my goodness, one of the best things about Freedom Planet. This is where I was reminded of Gunstar Heroes the most. These boss fights are so extravagant, a number of them being formidable just on sheer size. And even when they're not large and in charge, they're testing your reflexes with how fast they can move from one spot to another. They supply the game's biggest challenge, and given the nostalgic nature of Freedom Planet, you're gonna get your ass kicked if you don't begin to recognize the pattern of attack and exploit it. But once you've figured out how to avoid this strategy or learn how to avoid danger while providing the danger yourself, that slow motion finish at the end of the battle will be all the more satisfying. I am very happy to say that Freedom Planet was a lovely experience from beginning to end. Just as a warning though, because this is something I can't ignore no matter how much fun I had. I had two separate occasions where the graphics and frame rate started to stutter and outright flip the fuck out a few seconds later. Soon afterwards, the game would crash and I had to restart the level. This didn't happen at all during my first run through when I wasn't recording myself, but the moment I brought out the capturing software, yikes, instant graphical seizure. I'm not sure what's exactly to blame, I'd like to know if it's the game or my computer, but just to be safe, make sure nothing else is running in the background when playing Freedom Planet, unless you have the specs and RAM to safely do so. After the disappointment that was Sonic Boom, Freedom Planet did more than enough to fill the void. For $15, Freedom Planet offers a better fast-paced experience with more to do and better production values than what the $50 Sonic Boom could ever hope to achieve. 
So if you get a gift card this holiday or just have 15 bucks standing by and you're looking for a great time, you get Freedom Planet. Show Galaxy Trail some love and let them know that we would love to see more of this and I hope they follow up with something even greater. And again, a very sincere thank you to Endless End for your generous contribution. I think it's time for another marathon, focusing on games I received as donations throughout this past year. But for my last review of 2014, I'm going to keep a promise I made last year after reviewing Super Meat Boy by giving a previously visited game another shot now that it has a console re-release. The Binding of Isaac Rebirth, and I'll be looking at it on the PlayStation 4. I hope you guys look forward to that, and I hope you consider giving Freedom Planet a shot. With all that said, thank you guys for watching, have yourselves a great night, and take care.